This is Jeff Weiss and this week's unit is on greenhouse production. We're looking at the world's largest greenhouse in England here and uh, compare it with the greenhouse uh, that I have at the Nature Center for propagating plants and uh, shrubs and trees. Uh, it's 10 by 20 feet and so uh, you can see the range of sizes and shapes and uh, functions of greenhouses. Uh, particularly any time you take a drive in the country you're likely to see uh, hoop houses popping up and other greenhouse facilities in farm country and you see a lot of them in the suburbs uh, at garden centers uh, uh, and other um, uh, places that sell uh, especially to the landscaping industry. More about this production method and this type of structure in the following slides. So this week um, we're going to uh, have you be able to distinguish between greenhouse and nursery production and how each of them fits into the broad field of horticulture. Um, going to give you an assignment to visit a greenhouse or a nursery business and to uh, begin to identify with these uh, small business owners and to look at the issues and the cost drivers uh, for uh, this business in the Midwest. Uh, and finally, um, looking at some of the techniques, plants, transplants, container and in-ground production, hydroponics, and your um, uh, discussion this week will be on aquaponics. So some of the key terms are listed here. We'll get into all of these uh, as we go forth into the assignment. And uh, just to give you an overview of the greenhouse industry, um, the major crops that are produced in greenhouses are um, cut flowers and then uh, potted plants, uh, either for their flowers or foliage, uh, and then bedding plants, ornamental or food. And as you see by the USDA publication, uh, greenhouse uh, production of tomatoes has become a big business uh, in the fresh tomato industry. Um, many or most of the uh, tomatoes that you get in the grocery store nowadays are either um, brought in from Mexico or Texas or produced um, through greenhouse uh, production. Uh, overall in the world, uh, the U.S., Netherlands, and Japan are the top countries uh, globally for greenhouse production. And uh, there's a lot of interest in trying to make uh, greenhouses uh, more energy efficient and uh, using uh, technology to tap uh, uh, sources of heat, uh, such as uh, the cooling ponds of nuclear plants and the uh, methane that's uh, left over from uh, 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 trash uh, uh, dumps. So um, more uh, more about this uh, uh, when we get uh, further into the course. So just to uh, quick quickly differentiate between greenhouse and nursery production. A uh, greenhouse is inside a structure in a um, environmental controlled um, uh, structure where the uh, sunlight, moisture, humidity uh, can be controlled. Uh, plants can be grown either in containers or in hydroponic uh, uh, tanks uh, or in ground. Um, now in ground used to be fairly rare but with the production of um, tomatoes and other crops um, gaining ground in, in, in greenhouses, um, more and more of the crops are uh, grown in ground. And uh, greenhouse production is uh, limited uh, to warm season crops only. Uh, nursery production on the other hand is outside or can be protected, but it's usually subject to the weather. Uh, and again, um, Plants can be grown either in containers or in the ground, and uh, either cool season or warm season plants uh, can be grown uh, in nurseries. And uh, warm season plants are 
frequently protected in nurseries by uh, use of plastic culture. So some uh, plastic covering uh, uh, is frequently used even though the plants may not be uh, enclosed in a structure. So for greenhouses the advantages are mainly that they can provide a head start for field grown crops. Um, I uh, use a uh, low tower, a low tunnel uh, to protect the plants uh, in my garden. I, um, I usually plant end of March, beginning of April, uh, six weeks before um, the last frost. And uh, I can be pretty confident that uh, at least my cool season plants will survive uh, uh, the frost and snows of uh, early April. Uh, in my greenhouse, uh, I start planting uh, native plants uh, in uh, pots starting in January, and I uh, uh, start out with the heat at 45 degrees and bump it up to 50 and 55 and 60 degrees as the season advances. So I can start uh, growing uh, native plants in January and have uh, plants ready for sale at our plant sale in April. We have an Earth Day uh, plant sale at the end of April, uh, beginning of May, and uh, I grow uh, usually uh, 2,000 or more plants in that little greenhouse in time for that sale. Uh, crops can be grown during the off-season in greenhouses. Uh, quality is high as the growing conditions are controlled, so at a constant level of uh, temperature and humidity and carbon dioxide and sunlight. Um, uh, quality and consistency of the plants are um, likely to be quite high. And it, it needs to be because uh, usually only high value plants are grown in greenhouses. And greenhouses also allow for tropical cro crops to be grown in temperate zones year round. Now the disadvantages of greenhouses are that their initial cost of buildings and equipment is high. Uh, they have high overhead due to the operating costs um, especially um, energy to, if the greenhouse requires heat and that means that they are generally limited to high value or premium crops and greenhouses unfortunately are not suitable for all crops and uh, the size of the plants that can grow in greenhouse are limited so it's not practical for larger materials such as uh, uh, fruit trees and other um, large large plants so uh, another cut at the production costs. Uh, we have the direct costs uh, of building the of construction um, and labor and materials. Uh, uh, energy, I think, would um, be considered uh, a direct cost. And then there's a range of indirect costs, also called overhead of utilities and taxes, depreciation, administrative costs. And then uh, a third area of cost for uh, uh, people in the greenhouse business is marketing, uh, which includes uh, uh, selling costs, uh, transportation, packaging, and advertising. Um, there are several types of greenhouse businesses um, and potential employers in this field. Uh, there's growers who um, focus solely on producing plants for sale. Uh, they don't uh, have any uh, direct uh, uh, outlet for their uh, for their plants and they are dependent on customers to purchase the entire stock. Uh, grower wholesalers uh, grow and sell to other growers or they um, supply nurseries or landscaping businesses with their plants. And then finally, grower retailer, uh, quite familiar to us as the uh, garden center, uh, the local garden center, where the uh, uh, plants can either be raised from seeds or cuttings, or shipped in from uh, from from growers, and sold to the public uh, in spring for hanging baskets for Mother's Day and potting plants for getting the garden off to a good start. So some of the aspects of greenhouse culture in the next few slides. Uh, first is in-ground, uh, as I mentioned before, gaining ground. Uh, beds within the greenhouse are uh, uh, 
uh, set with uh, a very fertile um, loose soil and um, optimized for directly growing plants in the ground inside the greenhouse. Um, like all greenhouse uh, plants, they must be monitored closely for disease and pest problems. And um, it's frequently um, cover crops that are used in between production periods uh, to build the soil. Some of the common uh, uh, cover crops that are used are uh, alfalfa or vetch. Uh, uh, these plants, uh, the alfalfa adds uh, uh, nitrogen to the soil and the uh, vetch is another uh, legume that adds nitrogen and uh, is just turned into the soil as green manure where it breaks down and builds up the, uh, uh, the nutrient content in the soil. Uh, containers. Um, so for plants that are not grown in, in ground, that means they're grown in some sort of container, and they can vary from plug trays to large potted plants. Um, usually uh, containers are kept short term. Uh, plant tolerance and plants will thrive in containers only for, in a greenhouse for only so long. Um, some of these containers are extremely mechanized. Um, I was in the um, business of selling uh, uh, culinary herb plants um, a few years ago and we purchased uh, trays of plugs from a, a supplier who specialized in this and uh, all of the uh, seed planting, watering, uh, of these uh, trays of 96 or 380 plugs uh, was done mechanically. No one touched the plants. Uh, and then we purchased them and then we did the work of transplanting and uh, and finishing the plants and then selling them at uh, farmers markets and at uh, plant sales. Um, but this uh, uh, plug producer was based in Iowa, operating um, heated greenhouses and shipped uh, uh, trays of plugs to uh, growers like us around the country. Very, very high quality and uniform uh, uh, plugs because of this process. However, um, that operation did require a, a very significant initial investment in facilities and equipment and it still requires skilled labor to uh, operate the equipment and to know uh, what the market would be for those uh, for those uh, finished trays of plugs. Um, investment uh, and production is not good, not worth anything without customers ready, willing, and able to purchase uh, and be satisfied with the product at the end of the at the end of the process. Um, the next uh, uh, comment about greenhouse culture is soilless and um, uh, nutriculture is any means of growing plants without the use of mineral soils uh, and this can be either hydroponics or water culture which is the most common or aeroponics uh, or growing plants in the air uh, but either of these uh, techniques require uh, fertilization and uh, irrigation uh, but these uh, are becoming increasingly common as uh, more is learned and um, techniques become cost-effective. In fact, um, your assignment for this week, or at least the discussion for this week, is to uh, look at some videos uh, on aquaponics and to uh, describe uh, the systems that you're seeing and uh, um, learn more about this uh, emerging area. And so hydroponic systems um, uh, require root aeration. Uh, the roots need to be dark. Uh, they, the plant needs physical support, which the roots would normally, uh, the roots in the ground would normally survive, uh, would provide, and they need a supply of nutrients to support their growth. The two main types are um, non-recycling and recycling or circulating systems, and I'll show you some examples of those uh, very soon. Uh, but you can see um, the production uh, that comes out of uh, hydroponic systems can be very, very high quality and uh, consistent. 
So both critical uh, factors for the uh, restaurants and the high-end purchasers who normally are the customers for organically grown hydroponic system uh, grown food. So here's the uh, uh, the circulating um, system. Uh, on the right, uh, ebb and flow where the water is stored in a reservoir. Uh, periodically it's pumped into the system where the root zone is flooded and then pumped out again. On the other hand, uh, the, the um, uh, other uh, system is uh, a drip system, a top drip system, where the water uh, is uh, supplied in drip lines to the top, and uh, any water that flows through the pot back into the uh, uh, back into the pan uh, will uh, return to the. Uh, system. So these are both recirculating uh, systems and they um, have the benefit of being extremely um, uh, effective at conserving water. Uh, most irrigation systems, outdoor irrigation systems, uh, waste uh, most of the water through um, uh, evaporation or um, infiltration into the soil. Uh, hydroponic systems and aquaponic systems can be 98% uh, able to uh, recycle uh, and reuse the water. So aeroponics uh, are a system for providing the uh, support um, uh, for a plant uh, and keeping the roots in the dark without having it uh, constantly flooded with water. Uh, a passive uh, hydroponic system is one where the water level is, uh, is maintained and not uh, constantly recirculated. Um, these are both um, uh, less common systems than the uh, hydroponic recirculating systems that we uh, saw in the prior slide. So what is uh, where this is moving, uh, particularly for us uh, urban uh, types, is toward a uh, a system of um, uh, urban horticulture, urban agriculture, uh, making use of um, uh, industrial facility, industrial buildings um, that have been abandoned for their industry or making use of small uh, urban spaces, uh, vacant lots, um, uh, brown fields, and being able to uh, grow plants and realize the benefits of horticulture while uh, taking advantage of the um, uh, proximity to customers and some of the opportunities for um, using uh, recycling uh, energy and uh, and waste products from the from the city. So, um, some operators of urban gardens uh, collect compost from uh, restaurants, hotels, uh, uh, grocery stores, and individuals. They transport those uh, uh, those compostable materials. They compost them and use them uh, locally to grow urban gardens in a. Uh, organic um, system. And so these are a couple of examples of possibilities for uh, local sustainable uh, food production. There's a whole world of uh, amazing videos on, on YouTube. I've put a couple of them in, uh, uh, in the um, video uh, file for this week. But I also came across a place called The Plant. It's a converted uh, meat locker on the south side of Chicago. And they are doing some amazing uh, things uh, uh, to implement sustainable uh, horticulture, uh, aquaponics, and hydroponic uh, uh, systems that make uh, efficient use of energy, uh, uh, interchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen. There's uh, a, a brewery uh, that supplies carbon dioxide to the uh, uh, 
uh, for the plantings and takes oxygen for the uh, for the yeast. And um, there's some very very innovative and exciting uh, uh, things that are being done to conserve uh, resources and to operate. Uh, 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 within an urban environment taking advantage of uh, the um, waste streams that are um, uh, otherwise going to go out into landfills. Um, so um, long story short, um, this is an a interesting time we live in and I hope you'll uh, take this opportunity to become uh, more familiar with uh, some of the uh, uh, sustainable practices that are starting to be uh, developed. So that takes us to aquaponics. Uh, combines hydroponic uh, growing of plants with aquaculture. Um, the uh, fish uh, waste is applied as fertilizer for the plant roots and the plant uh, will uh, remove that um, fertilizer and supply uh, fresh water back uh, to the uh, to the fish. Um, tilapia or perch are some of the common uh, uh, fish used in aquaponic systems and uh, the grow beds uh, uh, receive the uh, the water containing the uh, nutrients in the in the waste from the from the fish and they can either be um, hydroponic aquaponic systems can either be in greenhouses or in uh, indoor buildings uh, uh, under artificial lighting. Now this example, uh, these photos came from uh, Growing Power, which is a Milwaukee-based uh, organization. Um, very, very innovative uh, uh, practices for sustainable urban agriculture. And they are moving uh, uh, into the Chicago area where they're uh, setting up operations and developing some of these same uh, some of these same practices. Another, <coughs> excuse me, another a very innovative uh, organization is the plant on the south side of Chicago and they have a website where basically they make all of their um, operations and practices uh, public information to anyone who wants to learn from them. So stepping back to the uh, greenhouse industry, um, some of the major issues and opportunities uh, that these operators deal with every day are their costs, the direct, indirect, and overhead costs, uh, competition from uh, local operators, and then uh, the big boxes. Uh, the big box stores, um, Home Depot uh, has uh, become the leading plant seller in the U.S. In the Chicago area, Home Depot uh, takes uh, truckloads of plants that are produced in Florida and, and uh, transported to Chicago and sells them uh, locally. Um, so th they are not as well adapted to our climate and conditions as uh, the production from uh, local operators. However, um, most of the plants from Home Depot do just fine. <laughs> Excuse me. And then uh, additional uh, uh, issues and opportunities involve um, planting for changing consumer tastes. In other words, um, there's fads and uh, um, styles in garden plants and cut flowers just like there is in everything else. And so the last thing a greenhouse wants to do is to get uh, stuck with a bunch of uh, plants that nobody wants to purchase. Um, so uh, anticipating uh, consumer tastes or innovating uh, new plants uh, or uh, cultivars uh, can be critical to the success of a, of a business. And then um, uh, getting the product out through advertising and promotional activities is also uh, critical and sometimes expensive activity. And then um, of course um, these businesses need labor. They need skilled um, people. Um, they need um, and usually are not able to pay a high salary uh, so they want uh, skilled help but affordable help. 
and unfortunately the uh, work is not always is usually not year-round that there's uh, busy season so um, the operators of these businesses are in a crunch where they want skilled labor cheap labor and seasonal labor so it's a tough uh, go for both those businesses and for um, employees who want to make a, a a good living in the greenhouse industry so um, your assignment for this week and for next week is to reach out to a greenhouse or a nursery business or a garden center to go in and visit and to interview a the owner or a, an employee and to uh, find out more about that business and then to uh, write up a report on your visit so that's assignment 8-9 is to uh, get inside the uh, industry uh, find out um, more about these uh, issues and opportunities and also to learn uh, what makes that business successful so uh, there are uh, local uh, businesses thriving and growing um, even though even with all the competition and your assignment is to find out what makes one of them tick so that's it for uh, for this time uh, I hope you're having a good good experience in the class and that you'll let me know if you have questions or if you need help.